Good evening and welcome to Tales of Cape Cod. Uh, you are seated on the site of the old colonial courthouse, which was originally built in 1763, before it was converted into a church, well before. Uh, and it also is the site of what we call here on Cape Cod the Revolution of 1774, or uh, what is now celebrated as, Barnes, as Cape Cod Independence Day next month in September. Uh, Tales was founded by Lou Cataldo. I've been doing a little research on where the organization comes from. He was a Navy veteran who served in the Pacific and lived here on the Cape for 66 years. Um, he was director of the Barnesville County Bureau of Criminal Investigations for 25 years, became Dennis Chief of Police in 1974, and he was instrumental in the technology known as fingerprinting. Cataldo possessed a, a strong interest in Native American history, and he was made an honorary member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Um, he and fellow historian Dorothy Worrell uh, pioneered the recording of Cape Codder's oral histories, which is an initiative that Tales of Cape Cod continues today. Our speaker tonight is Timothy Lindberg. He is a summer resident of Barnstable, hence the fan club. <laughs> and <laughs> he also lives in London and is active in the Hacklet. Hacklet Society, whose members and trustees study and publish world history on the great age of exploration and transatlantic trans voyages. Uh, many of the Hacklet Society's journal articles relate to British ventures, which uh, with the primary sources in English, but the majority of their journal is based on texts in languages other then English and translated from Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, Dutch, and some Russian, Greek, Latin, um, Ethiopian, and Persian, um, and Arabic. I myself brought my country's flag this evening, <laughs> Wales. <laughs> uh, my father grew up in Wales and uh, he was raised in South Wales um, and went to school, played football at University of Aberystwyth. So I um, feel we are neighbors of a sort. I have to read. <laughs> uh, many of you history buffs know that the earliest confirmed transatlantic trans voyages were by the Vikings a thousand years ago. but. Who exactly were these Vikings, and where did they go, and why? Did they ever come to Cape Cod? And could the Cape be the fabled Vindland? Timothy will take you on a historic journey of adventure, myth, hoaxes, and Viking hysteria. We will take questions immediately following his talk. Uh, prior to the dessert reception, homemade by Barnstable Village's own Jude Martin. Are there runes in the dunes? You be the judge. Timothy Lindbergh. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I honestly thought between the Delta variant and, and the rain I'd be uh, presenting to my son tonight, who, by the way, is my projectionist. But, um, but it's my pleasure to be here tonight. I spoke once before, two years ago, to this group about voyages and adventures to pre-Pilgrim New England. And that was the year before we were going to have the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we didn't have that last year, but worse things can happen. But um, at the, in that presentation, I talked about the first transatlantic voyages by Europe that we know about, and that obviously is the Vikings. And so I'd like to expand on that tonight and talk about Vikings and Cape Cod, are uh, there ruins in the dunes. It seems to me, or maybe it's just me, that on television and uh, Netflix, uh, you know, series and movies by uh, Disney, there's a lot of new content available for people to watch in terms of Vikings and the age of Vikings. But for me, I think when you mix Hollywood and history, they make a hash of it. 
And, uh, and for me, the truth is so much better. Um, I'd rather trust the truth than the, the, some script writer from Hollywood. Um, the fact of the matter is, is um, uh, most of you probably know the story of Leif Erikson and the fact that he may have been the first European to walk on these shores and discover America. But how do we know that? You know, who exactly were the Vikings? Um, how and why did they come across the Atlantic? And where did they go exactly? Did they go to Cape Cod? Are there, in fact, runes in the dunes? So tonight, with your indulgence, I'd like to take you on a little bit of a tour, tell you some stories. A true story with no Hollywood hype. A history of people with fantastic theories, a history of amazing finds, a bit of a history of hoaxes, but there's a lot of truth in it as well. So, but before I start, I titled this Vikings on Cape Cod, Other Runes in the Dunes, trying to be clever. Um, but first, let's make sure we all understand what runes are. So, to take you back a little bit, um, the, the Romans never conquered the tribes of northern Germany. So they never gave them, you know, religion, they never gave them roads, and they never gave them writing. So the Norse, the northern Germanic tribes, they developed their own script, their own way of writing. And it's interesting the way they did it. They did it in a way that everything was straight, so you could etch, there were no rounds in a simple form. The base, um, uh, what they would do is they would use those runes to basically label things that were of possession. They would, uh, they would etch the runes on, on wood, on ivory, on, 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 on bone, and, and oftentimes on stones. Um, but um, you might very well say, I've never seen a rune before. By the way, that's my, we'll go back one, Robs. That's my name in runes down below. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, you've all got runes. You've got runes on your phone tonight. When you think about it, the 1990s, the Swedish engineers from Ericsson and Intel were trying to think of a name for this new technology that they invented, which, which, which united tele mobile telephones and computers. And they thought of that ancient Viking king who united the tribes of Denmark in southern uh, Sweden, southern, in, in southern Norway. And his name was Harald Gormson. But because of certain dental imperfections, we know him as Bluetooth. So, if you take his name and take the Nordic, the rune for H, and you add it to the rune for B, Bluetooth, well, that's the symbol that's on your phones. You might also say that, well, you know, runes is kind of a dead script. No one uses it anymore. Well, that's kind of true, but not entirely. It took a long time for runes to die off. I think the Icelandic alphabet still has runes in it. And in fact, in Middle English, uh, for many years, they used runes in the, uh, together with the Roman alphabet uh, in English. Um, next slide. When you pronounce TH, they use the rune, which came to be known as a thorn in Middle English. And, uh, and uh, that was used for hundreds of years. But then when the printing press was invented, it was invented by the Germans in about the middle of the 15th century. And the Germans didn't have a typeset for the thorn. So they used the thing that was closest to it, sort of a capital Y. The rune looked like a P with the top cut off of it. So next time you go to England and you go to a lovely old, oldy English pub and you see ye old whatever, remember, it's not ye old, it's the old, the wiser rune. We just forgot how to pronounce it. Anyway, enough of runes. Uh, that's too much runic trivia for me. Um, uh, the point I was going to make is simply that if you find real rune stones, you'll know there are real Vikings nearby. So, wh who were these Vikings? We think we know who they were, but you know, Hollywood basically has, has, has given us a, a, a sort of a jaded view of who they were. What I'd like to do is take you back in time and really talk about who the Vikings were. Um, it's important for our story tonight not to think of them as just being, you know, pirate raiders and what have you. Um, the truth of it is not quite the same as Hollywood have you, would have you believe. Going back to the old days of the Norse, these people were basically seafaring nation. They lived in a, a small sliver of arable land, you know, in the fjords of Norway and the archipelago islands of, of uh, Denmark and, and Sweden. And um, what they would do is they would um, plant their crops in the spring, and then some of the men would go off and they would go a Viking, a Vikinga. So Viking really is more of a verb than it is a noun. 
but we will use it interchangeably with the, with, with the Norse because that's the convention. And so that continued for a long time. And it was a rough and tumble life. It was survival of the fittest. They would just raid each other to supplement their income. And they were master shipbuilders. The ships that they built were the best in Europe at the time. They were a clinker-built ship, and they were strong enough to carry cargo, to carry cattle, yet shallow enough to go up river systems, yet long enough and flexible enough to deal with the high seas. And what happened at the same time is Europe sort of fell apart, as you know. And particularly with the death of Charlemagne in 814, the Carolingian Empire fell apart. There was no central army. There were no navies. There was no coastal defense. And so the Vikings decided to take advantage of it, and they fell into that power vacuum. Hmm. So people generally think of the Viking Age as being from 793 to 1066. Because in 793, that's the first documented time that the Vikings left their home turf and raided abroad. And they raided a very, very venerated monastery on the northeast coast of England called Lindisfarne. And remember, the Vikings, they, they were pagans. Um, they thought nothing of slaughtering innocent, defenseless monks and taking their gold and silver, because that's what you do. And, they, and it was very profitable for them, and it was uncontested. So it continued for many years to come. But what, was, what started out as individual raids by small Viking clans for, you know, slowly turned into more organized raids where they put together groups of ships and went after not smaller little targets, but cities and what have you. And as early as 845, they had organized raids. And, they, and for example, there was 100 ships that in 845 went up the Seine, scared the bejesus of, out of everybody on the way. And when they finally got to Paris, they had no intention of taking over Paris. What they wanted to do is just sort of shake them down for a little money. And the weak Carolingian king had no choice. Charles the Ball paid them 7,000 pounds in gold and silver on that one event, which did two things. It made a few Vikings very rich, and it guaranteed that they were going to come back. And they did. And they had their secret weapon, some of you may know about. They, um, some of the Viking warriors had the view that if they took on the, the power of Loki, who was a shapeshifter, then they could become invincible against the enemy. If they just wore the, the skins of a wolf or the skins of a bear, then, then they wouldn't need any, 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 any protection. They could run in naked and fight, and sometimes they did. They would be hopped up on magic mushrooms and, uh, and various fermented berries, and they would drive themselves into a state. And they actually killed other Vikings when they were in this state. But uh, because they didn't need any armor, they were just bare-shirted, or bare-shirted, which translates to berserkers. And so we've got the term to go berserk today. It was very effective. My understanding is that that sometimes still happens today. <laughs> go back. But what happened was, is that these raids Hmm. There's only so many times you can shake someone down. And so they turned from raiding to trading. Where they couldn't raid, they'd trade. And not just in the west of Europe. It's important to understand that happened well into the east as well. They went all deep into the land of the Slavs and down to the Volga River, to the Caspian Sea, to the other side of the Caspian Sea, as far as Baghdad, which at the time was the capital of the Abbasid Empire, the Abbasid Caliphate. There's even a Viking grave which, which, um, in which you can find an 8th century Buddha from India. And they were always full of Abbasid coins. You see, the Vikings in the Far East, they were slave traders. But it was a very profitable business. Wherever they went, they'd set up trading posts. And so, for example, Kiev, the, the, the capital of Ukraine today, started out as a Viking settlement, a Viking trading post. And the people there, the Slavs there, had a, had a word for them. They called them the men who row, or the Rus. So today we have Russia, which is basically derived from the Viking traders of that time. They went down the Nipper River, across the Black Sea, in, and onto Constantinople, the most powerful uh, city in Christendom, which they called Miklagad, the, the great city. But of course, that was a bit too big a city for them to swallow. But the, uh, the emperor at the time was called Basil II, or Basil the Bulgar Slayer, as he liked to be known. He noted how good they were at, at, at fighting and how organized they were. So he hired them. And he hired them to be his personal guard and to be the vanguard of his army. And so we have the famous Varangian Guard, which protected Byzantium for 400 years, started by the Vikings. 
And their trading routes went all the way through the Mediterranean up the other side. They encircled Europe with their trading routes. So we think of them as raiders, but really they were a trading organization. There may be some people here tonight who were, des who were descended from Irish stock, in which case you would know that the city of Dublin started out as a Viking trading post, and in fact was ruled by the Norse for many, many years. In the north of France, they made such a, 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 a nuisance of themselves that the, uh, that the weak Carolingian king said, here's some land, just take it, but stop raiding us. And he did, and Rollo the Walker was given a slice of land. And in the Latin word for the land of the Northmen is the Normandy. Hence we have Normandy. But nowhere were they more important and had more influence than in England itself. Great swaths of England, you may know, were ruled by the Danes, by the, by the Norse, for hundreds of years. They had their own law, and it was fought over between the, the Anglo-Saxons that were there and the Danes and went back and forth. But eventually, it became part of, of, uh, of Denmark and Norway. In King Canute's great North Sea Empire. So the raiders were now the rulers. You know, everybody knows that uh, um, in 1066, people say that's when the, 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 the Viking period ended. And every school child in England is taught that, oh, in 1066, the French invaded England and everything changed. But that wasn't exactly as, as it was. In fact, it was the Normans that invaded. And the Normans were nothing more than Vikings who had learned French a few generations back. And the English king at the time, Harold II, well, his mother was Danish. His cousin was king of Denmark. His brother Tostig, doesn't exactly sound very Viking, was basically fighting for the Norwegians. And when, when William the Conqueror invaded England, he invaded on, according to the bio tapestry, dragon-headed longboats. Sure looked like Vikings to me. So some people say, well, you know, what happened to the Vikings? I've heard this in England where, you know, I know that a thousand years ago the Vikings were here, but when did they go home? Well, they didn't go home. They never went home. They just melded into the society. They became, they became you know, farmers, they became traders, they became merchants. I understand that some descendants of those fair-haired, mad-eyed Vikings went into politics. And later on, some of them did rather well. But, <laughs> and that, of course, is a cheap shot. Sorry, Boris. No, no I'm not sorry, actually. Go ahead. But the point is that when you know the true story of the Vikings, that they weren't just raiders, they were traders, they were rulers, they were colonizers. They were always pushing the edge of the envelope in terms of where people in Europe were going. It should be no surprise to us that they wouldn't have pushed the edge of the envelope across the, the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean, from England to the Faroes, Shetlands, Iceland, and beyond. But how do we know that's true? How do we know that's true? Well, when I think about early transatlantic voyages, I think of my favorite English Victorian wit, Oscar Wilde. And he said, many people discovered America before Columbus, but most of them had the good sense to keep quiet about it. <laughs> but they didn't keep quiet about it. Uh, the Norse at the time, they'd tell anybody who would listen to them in terms of what their, their ancestors had done. When you think about it, in Iceland, um, over a fire, in a longhouse, during a long, cold Icelandic winter, they would regale each other with stories about kings and battles, and to a great extent, about their families. And they would take these, these stories, and they would pass them down, generation to generation to generation to generation, for hundreds of years. Until finally, in the 13th century, the great Icelandic skalds like Snorri Sturluson wrote them down. And so we have the sagas. The sagas, the stories of the Old Norse, of which there are many, but there is only two that we care about tonight, and that is the Saga of the Greenlanders and the Saga of Eric the Red, together known as the Vinland Sagas. Oh, sorry, back. See, we hadn't practiced. Now, so I'd like to, let's start our story then. And, uh, and the way I like to tell the story of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of these sagas, the Vinland Sagas, is, uh, is to recount the fact that in England we had a show a little while ago called Neighbors from Hell. So you know the type. The kids are unruly, the dog's always barking, you know, they, they, they make a nuisance of themselves. But even within the Viking community, there were some people that were beyond the pale. And so our story begins with the story of Viking neighbors from hell. 
And that's the scariest picture I could find of a Viking. But, um, so according to the sagas, in the middle of the 10th century, there was this gentleman by the name of Torvald Avildsen. And Torvald, well, let's just say he had anger management issues. Um, he had an alter to make a long story short, he had an altercation with some of his neighbors, and a few people died. But actually, a lot of people died. And, uh, and the people there said, you're out of here. You are banished from the kingdom. And he had to take his family and leave. And he was sent to an island in the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, which now we know as Iceland. And there he went with his children. But the Viking apple didn't fall very far from the Viking tree. And his son, Eric, well, he had some issues too. He had an altercation with some of his neighbors, and a few people died. And he was banished to the far corner of Iceland, where he had an altercation with some of his neighbors, and a few of his neighbors died. And they finally said, enough is enough. You're out of here. Three years, you are banished from Iceland. But he had nowhere to go. He couldn't go back to Norway. He couldn't stay. He had heard that there was land further west. He had no choice but to chance it. So he got in his ships with his family and all his goods, and he headed west. And he found land. And he sailed under that land to the far side of it. And he found a couple of fjords that were sheltered and were capable for, for raising his, uh, his, his cattle. And, uh, and there he stayed, survived, and thrived. Three years later, in the year 985, he came back to Iceland and he told the other Vikings there, I have found this new green land to go to. And of course, the sagas make fun of the fact that he, he oversold the thing being Greenland, but um, you know, he was an early real estate agent, what can one say? Um, he had no problem getting people interested in going because Iceland by that time was quite overcrowded. There's not that much arable land in Iceland. And so 25 ships left and went to Greenland and hence started the Norse colony in Greenland. And of course, he was Eric the Red. Now you probably know that story, but the rest of it might be a little more obscure to you, because it didn't end there. The Norse on Greenland survived and thrived. They grew from a small colony to a group of four to 6,000. There were many voyages between Norway and Iceland, and between Iceland and Greenland, and Greenland and Iceland and Iceland and back and forth. They traveled hundreds of miles up the side, up the west coast of Greenland to, to hunt for walruses because the walrus ivy was very valuable. And they, they, they got the ivy and then they traded it through their trading system in Europe. And it was a very valuable commodity. They survived very well. So when you think about it, do you really think that the Vikings, given what you know so far, would go 900 miles from Norway to Iceland, then 300 miles to Greenland, stay there for 400 years, and not go any further west? That's unlikely. By the way, think of it this year, think of it this way. The Norse were in Greenland longer than the English have been in America from the time of uh, Jamestown to today. That's a very long time indeed. You'd hardly call them a colony. They were more like a country. But we know now, through archaeology and through digs at ancient Inuit sites in Canada, that the Norse did trade with the North American natives for a very long time, for hundreds of years, and probably made hundreds of trips to, 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 to Canada, to sub-Arctic Canada. And, I'm not quite sure. And that 400 years of settlement in, 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 in Greenland, um, basically, also next slide, they built churches, by the way. The Pope sent a bishop. There are Vatican records for many years about what went on in Greenland. So we know it's all very true. But the one that we care about, the first voyage from the Norse Greenlanders to North America was that of the famous Leif Eric's son himself. Eric's eldest son had heard from a traveler that had been blown off course that there's land further west. And this was just in a few years after the, the colony was settled, about the year 1000. And so the sagas tell us that he left, he went up north, and then went over due west to a land of great big flat rocks, and he called that Helluland. He went further south to a land that was full of trees and forest, where the forest grew thick right down to the shore, and he called that Markland, forest land. And then he went famously farther south than that, to a land where the waters were warmer, the ice did not form in, in winter, uh, a land of long sandy beaches, a land of self-sown wheat, a land of vines and grapes, and he called that Vinland. But where is Vinland? Could Cape Cod be Vinland? 
Well, now we, we have to go back to the sagas. Um, and I wish I could see the next slide. <laughs> back. Okay. For many years, no one really believed these sagas. Because after all, they thought that they were just myths. They thought they were Norse myths. Well, after all, the Greeks have their myths, Jason and the Argonauts. Well, the Norse have their myths, Eric the Red. And no one really took it seriously. And they forgot about Greenland. Now, one interesting thing is that in the middle of the 15th century, all those people in Greenland mysteriously disappeared. Nobody knows why. And that's another story altogether. We may come back to but there was one person that may have believed it. Just as an anecdote, we know that Christopher Columbus was in Bristol, England, on the west coast. And the men of Bristol, as they were known at the time, uh, and he was in the, in the year of uh, 1476, 15 years before he sailed the ocean blue. And the men of Bristol had traded with the Icelandic people for generations. They were in living memory of the Greenlanders. Columbus never said anything about this, but his son Ferdinand, after he passed away, had all his notes, and he, and he produced his biography in the first half of the, of the 16th century. And he said that in 1477, his dad went to Iceland. Why did he go to Iceland? Did he go to Iceland to know more about the sagas? Did he, know, did he go to Iceland to learn more about the land that was due west, as he was thinking about his theory about going west to get east? We just don't know, but that much is true. Well, there it lays for hundreds of years. Not much happened. People basically forgot about them. And then, until this man came along. And he was Carl Christian Ruffin. And he believed he was a Danish philologist and historian. And he translated the, the sagas into English. And he wrote a book called American Antiquities, in which he argued that the first Europeans to go to North America were, in fact, the Vikings, not Christopher Columbus. And everyone got excited about that. This is news to them. This is fantastic. Is that really true? Well, remember, this is also the time of romanticism. It was the time of, of romantic plays, music, art, and the thought of brave men on long voyages, beautiful women, lust, power, family struggles, myths, magic, monsters. Well, I'm told that's still popular today but it caught the popular imagination. And he started what's commonly thought of as being the Viking revival. And a lot of people were brought in on that. And they believed it. It was, it was interesting for the Europeans, but particularly interesting for people here in New England and in Boston. And there was one famous Bostonian, a famous poet, who believed what Raffin was saying. He had studied Scandinavian language, languages when he was in Europe, and, um, and he was a true believer. And his name was? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In fact, about that time, just off Cape, there was this incident where a body was basically washed out of a riverbank. And the interesting thing about this body is that he looked like he had armor on. He had a breastplate. He had chain around his waist and around his neck. And, uh, and Carl Rafen basically said, well, obviously, that's not a Native American. They don't wear coats of armor. That must be the body of an ancient Viking warrior. And, um, and Wadsworth took up the challenge, and so he wrote his famous poem, The Skeleton in Armor, in which he argued that there was this ancient Viking of old, and he wanted to marry the beautiful daughter of the king, but was denied. So he whisked her away across the Atlantic. He built her a round tower in Newport, Rhode Island, and la, 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 la. And uh, it captured the popular imagination and only added to this Viking revival. But... There's another one that came, another person came on the scene as well. And a neighbor of Longfellow, um, a fellow teacher and resident in Cambridge, was Professor Eben Horsford, the professor of applied science at none less than Harvard University. And he applied his science. He invented a new kind of baking powder, started a company, sold the company, had a lot of money. So here's a man who was very well respected, who had time in his hands, and who had the ability to basically solve the problem. And Wadsworth Longfellow convinced him to do so. He said, I'll take it upon myself. I will analyze these sagas, now translated into English. I will look at the coastline 
of, the, of, of, of North America. And I will see where Leif Erikson actually went. What I, what I didn't say is that the sagas are kind of funny because the Vikings never drew maps. But in the sagas that were passed down generation over generation, they were very detailed in how they explained when they, where they went. They were very big on topography, the flora and fauna, how many days sailing it was, how high the, sky, the sun was in the sky. It's really quite detailed. So Horsford thought, I shall apply my superior intellect and work this out. And that's what he did, sort of. He drew a map, and I have that map, so I'll show you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's true. Leif Erikson came down from Nova Scotia, and he landed on Cape Cod. He landed on Provincetown, according to Professor Husford. Now, if you think it's curious that where the pilgrims first landed is also where Leif Erikson first landed, well, I'm sure that's just coincidental. But Leif not finding it a suitable harbor headed west. And he came across a big harbor with islands outside and a navigable river. So he and his men rowed up that river, the first Europeans to row in the Charles. And he went up the Charles for a few miles till he found a safe place to, to, to pull his longboats out of the water. He picked Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, if you think this professor from Harvard, after analyzing the sagas in great detail and studying maps, came to the conclusion that Leif Erikson went to Cambridge, Massachusetts to basically start his colony. Well, I guess that's just coincidental. But things got curiouser and curiouser. He also decided to go into amateur archaeology. So he went to a plot of land not far from where he lived. And he started digging. And lo and behold, he found an old foundation. And he dug around that foundation. It was a home. It had a hearth. And, 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 and other little bits and bobs that he found there. And he declared, I have found Leif Erikson's house. <laughs> so not only did Leif pick Cambridge for his, uh, for his uh, colony, um, he and Eben Horsford were neighbors. And, um, and if you think that's funny, it would be very weird if you went to the, uh, onto the grounds of the Mount Auburn Hospital and saw this plaque. <laughs> On this lot, in the year 1000, Leif Erikson built his house in Vinland. You might be thinking, what did, who, who's joking here? What is this all about? But such was the influence of Horsford. People believed it. And it influenced the architecture of Boston. Have you ever wondered why the Longfellow Bridge over the Charles River is built on Viking longboats? Have you ever wondered why the Weld Boathouse at Harvard is festooned with Viking memorabilia? In fact, a lot of the buildings that were built at the turn of the century had paid homage to Boston's Viking past. Such was the influence of Mr. Horsford. Have you ever gone down Commonwealth Avenue, heading toward Fenway Park, and met this gentleman? None other than Leif Erikson, gazing out over the Charles River where he once rode, looking more like a Roman god than a marauding Viking. Once again, the influence of Professor Horsford. It got even weirder than that. That's again. Um, he actually claimed that, uh, that uh, Leif Erikson had 3,000 Vikings come to Cambridge. They built great cities. And it was the start of the, of the, of the legend of Norumbega, first mentioned by Verrazano in 1524. And he was off the rails by then, and people really didn't want to go with that. But anyway, it was, a, it, was a, it was an attempt, and it did influence people's minds. But what is the real evidence? What is the real evidence? Well, most of you will know that about 60 years ago, a husband and wife team of Norwegians basically traveled up and down the coast of, uh, of New England and southern Canada looking for evidence of Norse occupation. Helga and Anastina Ingstad. And indeed, with the help, fortuitous help, of a fisherman in the northern part of Newfoundland, they found Lanza Madone. They found the original you know, uh, foundations, and after more than a dozen years of painstaking research, they proved beyond a doubt that this was a Norse settlement. So the Vikings were in North America, and we know it. They found spindles, they found brooches that the Vikings used, and they, they found that they actually made iron there. But there are a couple things that you should know about this Lancer Meadows. One is that now, it wasn't the way the Vikings usually made their settlements. They would find some sheltered place. They would find some sheltered place where they could pull up their longboats, and they could have running water, and they could have some field to graze their cattle. 
There was none of that at Lanson Meadow. It's right on the edge of the cliff. Basically, the cold wind from Labrador is blowing into them. But what's good about it is anyone traveling down from the north would see it. So the thought is now, hmm, also, um, <laughs> there aren't any grapes in northern Newfoundland. And if, if you want to believe the sagas, and Leif Erikson named it uh, Vinland because there were grapes there, well, that doesn't really comport, does it? But the killer was the next thing, the humble butternut, or white walnut, which they found at the site. And there's no way butternuts grew at Lance Meadow, ever, anywhere near it. So the Vikings must have traveled further south. But where did they go? Could Cape Cod be Vinland? So let me tell you a couple stories. And please, at this point in time, keep an open mind. Because it's not good to shut down too early. Some of these can be fantastical, but one never knows. The first story I want to tell you is one that took place in Provincetown. The year was 1805, and there was a hill on the west side of Provincetown, about 30 feet high, and they had to level it to make room for a salt works, you know, where they, they dried seawater to make salt. And, uh, and they did that, and that lasted for about 50 years. So 30 feet of soil was removed and flattened out. And then, 50 years later, when it was no longer useful as salt works, they sold off the land, and people built houses, including this gentleman, Francis Payne. No, 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 yeah. And, um, and he built this house, and as he was building it, he dug down, and under his foundations, he found another foundation, a wall. But unlike any other wall that they would see, the stones were not from Cape Cod. They weren't field stone. They weren't glacial stones. They were cut stones, squared off stones, the kind of stones you'd use for ballast in a ship. He didn't really think too much about that. He showed it to a few people, and he just built this house. In 1926, archaeologists from Harvard University wanted to dig it up and find out what that wall was. They were denied permission. No one's ever seen that wall since, but it's still there, under number seven Cottage Street, Provincetown. Now, the story behind that is that Leaf's younger brother, Thorsten basically died, shot by what they call a scraling, which is the term they use for the Native Americans. And, and, and his ship and his, and his body never returned. And they're wondering, well, could that have been the ballast from his ship? I don't know. But rocks loom very large in our story, because that, after all, if you build something that's organic material and a thousand years go by, it's not there anymore, or it might not be there anymore, but rocks will be. So stones uh, provide better in, uh, evidence. And one of the most interesting stones you can find is not very far from here, just in the Bourne Historical Museum. And it's called the Bourne Stone. How very clever. And if you look at the bottom of this stone, you'll see etchings. They certainly do look runic. This is not a hoax. This stone has provenance. We know that this stone was used as a doorstone to one of the Indian Native American praying houses back in the 1680s. And the Native Americans didn't like their writing, so they had the stone face down on the ground. When the, when the praying house wasn't needed anymore, the stone went back to the Native American community, where it stayed until about 1930, and then it was given to the Bourne Museum, where people could really look at it. And many people believe, majority of people think, there must be something runic about it. But it's difficult to translate. And to be honest with you, there are more theories. That we, there are as many experts as there are theories in terms of what this is. Some people think it's Phoenician. I've heard someone thinks it's Chinese. I don't know how they got that. But it has yet to be discovered in terms of what those markings mean. And it sits right over there um, in the Bourne Museum. And there's another, even more famous stone that you probably have heard of. And that's the stone at Dighton Rock. And Carl Riffin basically said, ah, these are runes. These are runes that have been written over over the centuries. It's right in the river, in Taunton River, and, um, and to this day, no one really knows what those markings mean. And if they're runes, they're not translatable. None other than George Washington saw this stone. And he said, you know what? That looks like some of the writing on the stones that we have at my plantation in Virginia. George may have been right, but nobody really knows. 
Closer to home, there's another stone. South of Martha's Vineyard, there's an island called No Man's Land. And on that island, in 1926, I forget the guy's name who, who owned the, 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 the island at the time, but he found this stone. And on it is inscribed clearly in very good runic lettering, Leif Erikson, 1001. Now, what's curious about this stone is that, and you have to understand, runic lettering changed over time. And you can actually date an inscription by the type of, types of letters they used. It evolved. And the lettering here is correct for runic lettering at the time of 1000. So whoever did this, whether it was 1000 years ago or recently, did a little homework. But not a lot of homework. Because it's also dated M1. A thousand one. Well, as we talked about before, the Vikings didn't use Roman numerals. In any case, if Leif Erikson, Leif Erikson really wanted to you know, engage in a little New England graffiti, he would have had to have climbed the cliff on the south side of no man's land, go inland about, what, 120 feet or so, find a stone, etch his name in it, and then go off in his merry way and let a thousand years of erosion take that cliff down until just at the right moment, it falls off the cliff to the bottom, ends face up, so all can see Leif Erikson, 1001. You may or may not believe that's true. There are those that do think it's true. A few years ago, people tried to get onto the island, get the rock, bring it to Martha's Vineyard to really analyze it. But you may know, no man's land was a, was a bombing range in World War II and for decades thereafter. There's more unexploded ordnance on that island you can shake a stick at. So they weren't allowed to go and get the rock and bring it back. And to my knowledge, no one's seen it in 20 years as it slowly sinks into the Atlantic. But there are other stones as well. There's the rather famous Spirit Pond rune stones in Maine. And these are clearly runic but it's kind of gibberish. No one can understand what it says. It doesn't really mean anything. And in any case, the person who found this stone was told by the main state, ah, you must give it to us because you found it on state property. At which time, the stones disappeared. They couldn't be found anymore. Until a couple of years later, when someone said, a $5,000 reward to anyone who can find the stone and give it back to the state museum. And suddenly the stone materialized again. <laughs> so the person who found the stone was interested in the money, not in the history. But when it comes to hoaxes, we can talk forever about hoaxes and runestones. There's the Narragansett stone. Do you know they found runestones in Oklahoma? There's a famous runestone in Minnesota called the Kensington runestone, which is a very good fake, and a lot of people still believe it. But at the end of the day, they're probably fakes, and they, some of these fakes are very good. Yale University was defrauded of $300,000 for buying what were known as the Vinland maps, and they proved to be a fake. But let me leave you with one more thing that might make the hair on your back of your neck stand up a little bit. And that's this. This is known as the Maine Penny. A gentleman by the name of Guy Melgren, a retired school teacher from Massachusetts, used to love going up to, to Maine along the coast and, and digging around the shell middens. A midden is basically uh, a rubbish heap, if you will. It's where the Native Americans gathered and traded things, and so in a midden it would build up over the centuries, and you find arrowheads and all sorts of things in there. And in one midden, in the Goddard estate, he found this coin. I think it was in 1957. It's a silver coin. Well, he was told it was an old English coin. And Guy would show it to his grandchildren, he'd show it to all the people that came into his house, and he was showing the artifacts, and that would be one of the artifacts and of the arrowheads that he'd show them. And, um, and then when he passed away, he gave all his artifacts, including this penny, uh, to the Maine State Museum. But a couple of years later, someone from London, a coin dealer, who had heard about it, came and took a look at it. And he said, well, that's not English. I think it's Norse. And he called the people that he knew at the University of Oslo in the State Museum of Norway. And they came over and they took a look at it. And they confirmed, yes, that's a Norse coin. That's a coin from the reign of Olaf III, something like 1075 to 1080. So immediately people think, well, you know, it's a hoax. The guy got the stone, he got the coin, he threw it in the midden and said, oh, look what I found. But I'm not so sure about that. In fact, I don't think it's a hoax at all. So you tell me, is it a hoax or a true find? 
Guy Milgram never profited from this discovery. He never sought fame. And those are two things when it comes to hoaxes that kind of should, a red light, shall we say. He never knew the coin was Norse. He died thinking it was English. They didn't find out that until afterwards. He never told anyone it was Norse. The coin was debased. Basically, Olaf III ran out of money, so he debased his currency. And good money chases out bad money. It wasn't in circulation very long. So they perforated those coins and they used them as trinkets. They would use it to trade with the Sami people in the north and uh, for, for reindeer pelts or what have you. And this coin had been perforated. The coin was therefore relatively expensive because it was rare. It was the wrong date. If you really want to pull off a hoax, why pull off a hoax with a coin from 1075? That's 75 years after Leif Erikson was supposed to be around town. And if you really wanted to have a coin, you could get a coin from the reign of Olaf Tryggvason, who was the king at the time, or Ethelred the Unready, or, and there were lots of these coins, many more than this, and cheaper. Why would you take an expensive rare coin to pull off a hoax? But just very recently, and this is the clincher, uh, the professors from the University of Oslo revisited this coin. And they revisited all the coins from the reign of Olaf III. And I have to say, one thing about the Norwegians is they're very detailed. They know about every hoard. Every single time they find a, a, a hoard of coins, they document how many there were, what reign it was from, and also what the state of the coin was in. It's a very complicated system of grading coins, you know, mint condition down to whatever. And they concluded that it wasn't possible for Guy Melgren in and around 1957 or earlier to even acquire this coin. It didn't exist. So I say, it's a real coin. It's a true find. But ladies and gentlemen, you tell me what a Viking coin is doing on the, on the, on the coast of Maine from the year 1075. But we remember what we said before. Leif Erikson's wasn't the only voyage to North America. The Norse Greenlanders were trading with Native Americans for hundreds of years afterwards. And we know that from other finds further north. Perhaps in the year 1150 or something, um, some Vikings were trading with, with some um, Norse in Newfoundland or north, and that coin got into the Indian trading system and was passed from tribe to tribe and ended up in Maine. Or perhaps, perhaps, the Norse were trading with the Native Americans as far down as New England. We don't know. So this takes us back to the sagas. And I'm going to go back to what Professor Horsford tried to do. And I'm going to play a little game with all of you tonight. We're going to play a game of geographic jigsaw puzzle. What if I told you the following things are a reasonable interpretation of the sagas and would give you directions to exactly where Vinland is? And knowing, as all of you do, what the coastline looks like oh, through all of North America, you can probably work out where I am. So I'm going to say, these are the directions to, to Vinland. First of all, you're going to be 150 to 300 miles from Nova Scotia, heading south. The sun is just above the horizon at 4.30 p.m. on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. And we know that would be about 42 degrees latitude. That's Boston. You must pass along a sandy wonderstrand. This is a term they used in the, in the, in the uh, sagas for an unbelievably long beach. Like, when is this thing going to end? And uh, that's the term they used. And at the end of that wonderstrand, you're going to head into a shallow sound with islands to the south. And then, after 10 to 20 miles, you're going to come up to a river which heads north. Very shallow entrance. You can only get into it at high tide. And the river takes you to a lake, a place of safe anchorage for your, for your ships. So if I told you that's a reasonable interpretation of what the sagas say, where am I? Either you're very good at geography or you know the story. Sorry, go. No, I don't know the story, but Pass River. Brilliant. And, and where's the lake? Fallen's Pond. You'd be in Fallen's Pond. 
Well, if that's a reasonable interpretation of the sagas, that would take you to that spot. And that's exactly what a guy by the name of Frederick Pohl thought about 60 years ago, 70 years ago. And he went there thinking that this is a good place to look around. And this is his detailed map of what he found on the south and west side of Fallen's Pond. And there are three things that excited him. One is it's fit with the sagas. And secondly, oh, by the way, the, he, he wrote this up. And it was so convincing that the New York Times said, finally, the mystery of Vinland is solved. There you go. And he thought it had a good geographic fit with the sagas. Maybe true, could be other places, but we'll see. And he also found mooring holes. So you have to know that the Vikings didn't anchor their ships. They would drill holes into rocks. They would put a, a, a metal spike into it attached to a rope, and they would secure the boat. And when, when they wanted to leave, they just pulled the pin and off they went. It was their way of mooring. They used mooring holes. And Paul found mooring holes on Fallen's Pond. Here's a close-up of a triangular mooring hole. Now, seems pretty good to me. However, other people say, well, those, there were a lot of holes in rocks in Cape Cod. They went up there in the early 1900s and they blasted those stones because they needed them for the breakwater at the mouth of the Bass River or for the bridge that went over Bass River. I don't know. You tell me why they're, tri why they're triangular and not round. Leave that as an open point. And he also found something else that excited him. And that is he found a ship gully. So on the southwestern part of Fallen's Pond, there's a natural gully running from the, 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 the lake, which at high tide you could pull a sharp ship into, and it could be 50, 70 feet long and fit into this natural gully. And in the middle of the gully, along the keel of a boat, there were posts driven into the sand, seemingly to support the weight of a ship. And he was very excited about that. But needless to say, there are a lot of other people that checked up on Frederick Paul's ideas. They looked at it, and he said, well, it is very old, but these post holes are probably from the Revolutionary War, not from Vikings a thousand years ago. Paul kept to his story because he said, well, they may be, may be, may be support uh, pillars from the Revolutionary War, but there may have been pillars even earlier than that. But having said that, if you don't know how to get there, I can tell you how to get there. As you go heading east and you go across Bass River, look to your left. That's Fallen's Pond. And if you get it from the old exit nine, by the way, why did they change the numbers of all these exits? But, but, if you get off the old exit nine, and then you get up and you go to Saga Road, and then you take a left, and then you go to Thorvald Drive, and then you take a right, and you go to Leif Erikson Drive, <laughs> and you come to the corner of Vinland Drive and Viking Drive, and you keep going on, and then you find yourself at Vinland Norseman Road. Um, obviously, the real estate developers at the time were so convinced that this was true, they bought up the land and named all the, the streets in anticipation of being selling houses that were near the original place of Leif Erikson's. Anyway, there's one other thing I want to mention, and that is if you take the sagas literally, remember, and if you want to believe that the, that, that the Vikings came to Cape Cod, we don't exactly live on a rock here in Cape Cod. It's changing all the time. Have you ever kind of, you know, gone to a beach and said, something changed last year, but I'm not quite sure what. It's changing all the time. When the pirate ship, the Wudda, went down in 1717, it went 500 feet off of shore. When they found it in 1984, it was 1,500 feet from shore. It's changing all the time. And with the help of my son, he put together this little clip from, from 1984 to today. And I want to show you what's happened at Chatham. It's like ice cream melting off of your elbow. That's just 35 years of erosion in Chatham, melting all that sand off of Nosset further down past Chatham onto Monomai. Well, what do you think happened over a thousand years? I've asked what the Cape looked like a thousand years ago. Well, the sea level was probably a meter uh, 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 higher, sorry, lower than it is now. There's a lot more land mass to Cape Cod. But Provincetown is slowly being pushed further west 
and Nossets being stripped and Monomoy's growing and the Cape is a moving feast. So just keep that in mind. So in any case, what do we know? Well, first question is, did the Vikings come to North America a thousand years ago? Absolutely they did. Also, did the Greenlanders keep visiting North America for hundreds of years? Yes, they did. We know that to be true. Did the Vikings travel south of Newfoundland? Well, yes. There's absolutely every reason to think that that's true. Did Vikings visit Cape Cod? I would say the answer is somewhere between possible and probable. But is Cape Cod Vinland? Well, we may never know. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, no. I want to say, I want to say one thing, one thing. That, um, you know, if you're feeling enthused, if you're feeling driven, and, uh, and you want to kind of get in your car tomorrow and drive up to P-Town and look for runes in the dunes, I'd have two pieces of advice for you. One, you might want to curb your enthusiasm. Because in 400 years in Greenland, they've only found less than 40 rune stones. And secondly, if that doesn't bother you and you still want to go up and look for runes in the dunes, then take these with you and look about a half a mile east. Thank you very much. Any questions? Good guess on Bass River. Yes. Can you give some information about that Stonehenge thing in New Hampshire, whatever that is? Oh, that's just one more of a, a, of a long list of them, yeah. Uh, there's a book called Fantastic Archaeology, where, where I forget his name, he, he goes through all of these one by one. And, um, and it's a litany of hoaxes. Uh, it's entertaining, but, um, but that's what they are. I mean, such was the interest in, in, in people's need to believe that rune stones were popping up like mushrooms all over the place. You know, someone, someone said that they were in the back of their church and they stumbled across a rune stone. Well, you really wouldn't after a thousand years, would you? But having said that. Sure. Yep. Yeah, Blue Rock is on Bass River. Yeah, that's one of the mooring stone rocks. Is it blue? I think it's, it's just bluer than the other ones around it, perhaps, yes. Yeah, and that was mentioned by Frederick Pohl as well, as a possible mooring site. Hello. Hi, you suggested that the runes have not been deciphered yeah, that's, that's true. So they, they think they are runes, but they don't know what they say. And also, uh, when the Norse wrote in runes, they wrote in a very flowery way. They didn't exactly say, you know, uh, you know uh, this is my house or something like that. Uh, and so you can read what it says, but you might not know what it means. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. The, the one that I showed before was one of the gelling stones, which was uh, uh, for Bluetooth in, 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 in Denmark. And they're found all over the place, yes. And, and, uh, and in Iceland, uh, yes. Yes, Steve. Script. So, yeah, no, uh, they, they, they actually think that it might have been derived from an earlier Greek script, but way predating Romans. Uh, what I've read is it could have been related to an earlier Greek script that, that was then sort of morphed over time into what we now know as runic. But as I said, it also evolved over time. There's old Futhark, new Futhark. It's called Futhark because those, that's the, how you pronounce the first six letters of, of runic lettering. And, and so it's, uh, as it morphed, it became possible to date it. But where it came from and how it started exactly, 
They don't know. Steve. Hey, neighbor. So, everyone that I spoke with, except for one person, coming into this uh, session tonight, thought there was a typo in your title. Uh, the ruins. Uh, yes. And uh, I'll bet it's a big part of the audience here tonight. Who, uh, I know it. We thought that. Uh, so I'm curious as to this, where, why don't we hear anything about? Uh, do you have a theory as to why we don't hear? We don't hear anything about ruins tonight. <laughs> Rubens. Oh, runes. 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 Yeah. Oh, well. The, um, I mean, we were, yes, I think so, many, so many people saying, oh, Tim had a typo in his presentation. Are you I heard that. But of course not. No. So uh, uh, it's new to a lot of us. Do you have a theory on why that would be? That no one's ever thought about runes before. Yeah. Um, that it's not something that's in the common room. Mm, well, but that may just be what it is. I, mean, I, I don't know, but um, um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is if you want to confirm the presence of ancient Vikings, find a rune stone that's real. Nothing else would have lasted a thousand years. Uh, the tower that's in Newport, mm -hmm. is that, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that was that was uh, Longfellow used that in his, his in his uh, um, poem, and that probably added to the rumors about it really being a, a Nordic tower. But um, I think it's pretty clear that that was owned by Benedict Arnold's grandfather, uh, who was called Benedict Arnold, who was the first governor of Rhode Island, and uh, he had copied. There are similar structures in England that look like that, and uh, and people have claimed that there are runes inside, but people see what they want to see. I, I think it's. Uh, oh, they did some archaeology on it, and, and they. They. Uh, sorry, I made it too long. Oh, they dug under it, and the only artifacts they found were, were broken, uh, you know, tobacco pipes from right about the Revolutionary War, you know, you know, the same sort of period that would be in question. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, Viking or Norse. Thank you very much.